All right, so yeah, this is our panel about Layout Builder. I'm really excited to have these three speakers with us today because I know they all have a lot of great experience and knowledge on this topic. Um, we'll just start out and do a quick round of introductions so you know who we are and what our background is and where we're coming from. Um, I'm Heather Wozniak. I'm a product owner at Open Scholar. Open Scholar is a platform for researchers to build websites so they can share their research with the world. Um, and I've been working with Drupal for a very long time. I actually am in the very little experience with Layout Builder. We do, we use it in a limited way in our Open Scholar platform. So I, that's one of the reasons I had the idea for this panel today because I personally selfishly want to learn a lot more about it. Um, who'd like to go next? Nikki? Oh, well, first of all, can you get a seat? There's a couple of stack seats and some other empty chairs here towards the front, so don't feel like you have to stand for a whole hour. So yes, Nikki Flores. Monica Deer on Drupal.org. I'm a technical project manager at Lullabot, and this project that we're working on currently is using Layout Builder, so I had a lot of opinions from my devs. Happy to share the rationale and how we got here. Hello, Andrew Morton, uh, Morton, 2K, Morton A2K on Drupal.org. I'm a, life, a long time Drupal dev and a uh, consultant. I currently help organizations improve their dev team performance. And I'm Rick Hawkins. I'm RL Hawk on Drupal.org, where I maintain a couple dozen modules that I've um, written over the years and contributed back. I am the I lead the team at Solemn, which is a business and technology consulting firm based in Seattle. We have about 45 offices around the world. I'm an Acquia certified full stack developer, and I've been building sites with Drupal for about 16 years, and uh, I'm an organizer for the Seattle Drupal user group. Great. All right, let's dive in and start asking questions. Um, so the first thing uh, we wanted to go over is just the basic question of what is Layout Builder, just to make sure everyone has a kind of level setting understanding of that. Um, Rick. So yeah, just to sort of make you know make it clear what we t what we're talking about when we when we uh, say we're using Layout Builder because uh, at its core, Layout Builder is a way to place content on a page in Drupal. So in that way, it's similar to other solutions that have been used in the past, like panels or display suite. And um, Layout Builder leverages core functionality built into Drupal. So specifically blocks, the block API, the layout API. And there are a couple different ways of using um, Layout Builder, if you could so one of them is for site builders, and that's it, wh what, what happens when you enable Layout Builder for a display mode for a particular entity bundle, say a content type. So you've probably seen that checkbox that allows you to enable Layout Builder, and that gives you the opportunity to configure the default layout. And it essentially replaces the field list that you would ordinarily see on that page. And, uh, I want to emphasize that that's configuration. So anything you make there, and that's why it's a site builder tool, you're making configuration changes, and anything you do in the default layout is is part of configuration. So if you're, um, you know, if you're committing your configuration to a repository, you're going to need to do that after making changes there. And so on the default layout, uh, site builders can place layouts and sections. Um, and that terminology, th th those terms can be used sort of interchangeably at times. You'll hear section, you'll hear layout. They're essentially the same thing when you're, when you're on the Layout Builder page. And you can place blocks. And all entities that are created of that bundle, so content type for instance, are going to use that default layout. So the other way that Layout Builder can be used is this second column there where you've enabled overrides. And that is for content editors because that's going to allow customization on a per entity basis. And the same features are available that are, that are uh, available in the default layout for the site builder. And one thing to mention is that the customizations that are made there, the layouts and the blocks that are placed, are content. So that's not going to be configuration. And once an entity is overridden, it is split off from the default layout, and so any future changes to the default layout are not going to go back to the overridden entity. And it's important to take that into account. Anything to add? Yeah. 
I'd say one thing about Layout Builder that we are doing a little bit different is each is placed item is a, no is a node, and so it is actually able to change the content of the node, add a link, change the image, change the focal point of an image, add additional fields to that content, and then place that content throughout the site. So that's another way to start thinking about how we structure our content, how we place the content, and more importantly, how the users are going to be interfacing with the content. I see this bit of a, a composition tool where you can see all your options that you have available to place in the layout, and you can visually see you know, how things are structured. Um, the alternative would be to do, be doing everything in templates. And one other term that I think you may see is inline block. And essentially, that just means a one-time block placement as opposed to the global blocks that you might create uh, on the global content. Uh, you know, I think in the Drupal language, it's custom block, but um, it's not reusable. So it's going to be a one-time instance of a particular block for a particular entity. Great. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what is being done to improve Layout Builder in Drupal core? And so I think you could talk either at a high level about Experience Builder and Starshot and these initiatives we've been hearing about, or maybe even more immediately directly about things that you've seen there as being improvements and changes. So uh, obviously we heard about Experience Builder yesterday from Dries. Um, that's, we, that's the information we have on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There, there was recently a layout builder initiative, um, and I, my interpretation of that is that it's become a bunch of issues in the Drupal.org issue queue. Um, I've been trying to track what's been going on. There's a few that stand out to me as sort of bug fixes for what we currently have, um, but it does seem like there's a, there's a lot more happening um, behind the curtain somewhere. Um, some of the issues I'm looking at, uh, one of them is, um, giving you an option in the UI to choose between creating a reusable block or an inline block. Um, so there's little like like quality of life stuff with Layout Builder that there's a few important issues that are close to getting closed out. But yeah, that initiative was announced at DrupalCon Lil last year. And I think it was called like the Layout Improvement Initiative. And as Andrew said, it's largely a series of issues in, in the Drupal.org issue queue and um, Experience Builder seems like it's going to be um, sort of a bit a larger initiative than that. I'd be curious if you could just do a show of hands. Is your site using Layout Builder today? Can we just see in the room? About half. Uh -huh. So this is our tool. <laughs> this is something that we can start to either build on, improve, or determine what fits into Experience Builder as a, as a community. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of upgrade path there will be to, you know, if you wanted to start a project now and you wanted to use Layout Builder, will you be able to sort of m move seamlessly into Experience Builder uh, once it's available? Uh, there's also the decoupled initiative, Layout Builder uh, UI. Right from from Pittsburgh last year that uh, that uh, previous next is building it's a React based uh, decoupled uh, layout builder that's the one you were referring to right mm -hmm. yeah I'll also give a shout out to uh, Mercury Editor um, I saw a demo of that yesterday it was pretty cool um, it's it seems like it's primarily based around um, paragraphs but it's got a really slick uh, editor for both the content that you're editing with the layout for that content. What kinds of organizations and projects do you recommend Layout Builder for? Yeah, so I can definitely take this from my perspective. Our team spent quite a lot of time in the beginning of the ideation process to determine the best solution for our authors. And just to set the stage for the project that I'm on, it's multiple different individual organizations. And each organization has a dedicated or sometimes not dedicated web editor, so it's either the public information officer, if it's a larger organization with a lot more layers, or if it's a smaller organization, it'll just have one or two subject matter experts, and as I mentioned at one of the presentations, a subject matter expert who's, for example, an attorney, 
becoming an admin level user on a Drupal site is terrifying, right? <laughs> and so we are very mindful of the idea that Layout Builder is here to support the authors. There's a lot of different types of content. So as an example, the press release person might be building a governor's press release and they want that to go to all the different places where that press release goes. It's the RSS feed that goes to Gov Delivery subscribe newsletter. It might be the featured news on the home page. It might be a listing page of all the news items. But the person doing the press release is not aware of any of that. All they want to do is say, here's the date, here's what they said, here's the photo, done, right? So we have to start thinking not just as builders, but as the people making the experience happen for the authors. And so for our situation, thinking about each of the different micro content pieces, so we have things like promos, call to action, statistics, which are general statistics. We have things like automatic lists that combine content into a format. And then using all those different pieces and then placing that using Layout Builder onto landing pages and then constraining the ability for landing pages to only be edited by people with a little bit more training. So here's a writer who can just write. Here's an editor who can edit. Here's a publisher who can access the lay layout and create the landing page, and then here's the agency manager who can do GTM codes and change the color palette, right? So we have these different layers. The ones who are interacting with Layout Builder are the ones who have a lot more training and understand that these all these different pieces of structured content can be placed into the layout and then repurposed, reutilized. Um, I think Layout Builder is, has benefits uh, almost immediately. Um, that, so as Rick was mentioning, um, you can use it as a site builder or you can use it as a content editor. And I think as a site builder, there's use cases right away. Um, if you ever need to place a block on a content type, that's usually my first go-to for installing Layout Builder and doing it through that UI because it really um, prevents cluttering the normal global block layout. It's a, it's a great alternative to using the global lo block layout and then just restricting it to a single path, which would be, you know, get kind of messy real fast. Would you say there's any kinds of sites or organizations that it's not suited for in situations when you would recommend avoiding it? Uh, again, we'll do that. We didn't have budget to do a global translation localization initiative from the very beginning. So that might be very sticky if you're attempting to serve your pages with the different pieces inside in different languages. It may not be a great fit for your situation if that's what you're facing. I would double down on that and talk about the expectations because if a content author is imagining like a streamlined UI, um, in order to actually create that with Layout Builder does take a lot of effort. Um, I think it makes sense when you've got a, um, a big budget for design, maybe you're building a component uh, library or a design system, it pairs really well with that because that creates the components that uh, the authors will be able to use in their layouts. I think that kind of connects with this next question. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about how using Layout Builder then changes the way you approach the design, the content strategy, and the architecture side of things. It's another tool in my tool belt. So when I look at a mock-up of a page, I start slicing it up, and I'm thinking about uh, layouts and actually SDC components as well. Um, so I'm going to have a front-end mindset, and I'm thinking about where components might be reused, what kind of options I want for variants, and what kind of flexibility needs to be there. It certainly has an impact on how you might do theming. And um, if you do end up placing fields, for instance, um, this is if you're the site builder and you're placing fields using Layout Builder instead of the normal field um, options, uh, one way to go is to place multiple fields with a single block uh, using a specific display mode. So then you can do your normal formatting with a node template, for instance, rather than having to do individual block templates for every field, which is what otherwise what you might have to do. Oh yeah, so the way we've approached it in one of our implementations is, it's hard to explain without visually, you'll see it in a bit, is there's different sections. Inside the section, you can change the color. So we have some variants, a light, a white, and a dark variant. Then we also have palette switchers, so they can choose light, white, dark, 
palette one, light white, dark palette two, light white, dark palette three. Then the blocks can be placed inside each section. So you have pretty nice combinations that authors can create out of the same root pieces and big fan of only one of everything. So here, our hope is you have one of everything. You don't have multiple versions of the same call to action or multiple versions of the headshot. Oh, we want you to have the one call to action that has the image, the call to action, the text, and then you can help the author determine which placement they wanna choose and that can be edited on the fly. So here I am, the author, I'm tasked with putting the governor's headshot on the page. I put that promo on the page and then I say, image on the left, default. Then my editor comes in and says, nah, we have a better photo, can you change it, change focal point? And then they get image on the right with a graphical treatment. And then you take that promo and place it into a basic page because there's another bio page or some other page that that agency is trying to promote. So considering one of everything, variants to support your authors and other stakeholders, and then content-wise, yeah, thinking about your content in a way that when people are searching, they can find it <laughs> easily. That's another thing we'll talk about. And also that if they need to make an edit, they make it one place and it perpetuates in all places where that statistic or that graphic or that media library emit or whatever is being embedded. All right, uh, let's, we're gonna start digging in to a little bit more specifics about how to implement this stuff. So what are the must-have add-on modules to improve the layout builder experience? So Layout Builder first uh, became stable in Drupal Core in 2019, and in the five years since then, there hasn't been a whole lot of progress within Core, so most of the work has been to improve Layout Builder has been done in the contributed modules um, that people have been created, and a lot of them address some of the same pain points that you all who have worked with it have experienced, specifically around restricting the number of blocks that are shown, for instance. Um, and Im just improving the overall user interface. So um, my top recommendations, um, my must have uh, absolute uh, requirements are, the, are, the, are addressed to th those two issues. Uh, the first one is Layout Builder Browser, and this one is being discussed as part, has been discussed quite a bit as part of the uh, Layout Improvement Initiative, essentially um, taking some of the functionality from Layout Builder Browser and incorporating it into Layout Br Builder. What Layout Builder Browser does, when you, once you enable it, you've reduced the number of blocks that appear uh, to, a, to the content editor to zero. You have to build up from scratch, but that gives you full control over how those blocks are named, how they're organized. You can choose categories, and it simplifies the placement of inline blocks. You can have it be a one-click uh, one click to be able to place uh, an inline block. And again, inline blocks are just single instance usages of a content block. And then the other recommendation of mine is Layout Builder iframe modal, uh, and that's because um, it's, it's just a lot cleaner to have the form uh, for, a block, for a block configuration in a modal element rather than a sidebar that is very narrow. And especially with a WYSIWYG editor, it gets very challenging. There is an iframe, uh, there's, there's a, mo a module called Layout Builder Modal, which uh, I think has more usages, and it works fine, it works great. Um, it's, it doesn't have this, uh, it displays forms in a modal also, and, uh, but it, it doesn't style them, uh, it styles them using your default, your default theme, your front end theme. And what I prefer is to have my admin theme be used for, for that. You can choose an administrative theme, but it's hard-coded to seven, which is an administrative theme that is no longer in Drupal core. So I prefer the Layout Builder iframe modal module because it lets you choose to just use whatever admin theme you're using, and I tend to use Jin, and so it looks great uh, with all the other elements uh, on you know, that the, that the editors are, are, are working with. And then some nice to haves, there's uh, the Layout Builder Restrictions module, which allows you to limit the blocks and layouts on a per display mode basis. So you can say for, um, for a particular uh, 
content type. I want to be able to allow these blocks but not others. And, and then layout builder restrictions by role allows you to limit what blocks appear uh, according to the role of the user. And they all p those both play well with layout builder browser. So you can get really fine grained control over what blocks are available for users to be able to place. And then layout builder lock allows you to prevent adding or updating specific blocks or layouts on the page, again with very fine grained control. So uh, my first two on this list are uh, related to single directory components. Um, I think that single directory components and layouts is a match made in heaven. Um, the first one here, SDC block, lets you place SDC components directly in the layout. So the way that works is with um, SDC, you define your props and slots, um, and automatically you get a edit form. So it's super minimal to, to create a custom widget and just throw that in your layout. Uh, the next one is SDC display. Um, there's other modules kind of like it where you build a component and then you sort of wire the fields for an entity into that component. This just does it with SDC. And uh, the relation to layout builder here is similar to what Rick was describing earlier where you might um, configure a display mode and then put that inside of another display in a layout. Um, so using SDC display, you could configure your display mode to, to render a component, and then essentially you can put that component inside of its own layout. Uh, and then the rest of these, these are sort of miscellaneous uh, modules that I've added just kind of for convenience. Uh, layout Builder Operation Link, it's a tiny thing. It literally does what it says. When you're in the content listing, normally you have that edit button on the right. This just lets you uh, get a quick link to go to the layout for that content. Um, layout Builder Usage Reports, it's really great when you've got a bunch of different pages, different bunch of different components, lets you see where everything is used. So maybe if you have to make a change to something later on, this will help you figure out like what needs to be tested. Layout Builder Save and Edit, again, really simple. This just adds a Save and Edit button to the layout form. Um, sometimes I'm experimenting with changes and I want to be able to see it on a different tab. Um, so I'll use this to quickly iterate through those changes because otherwise it'll just save and go back to the view side and you have to click layout and make your, it's just complicated. This next one, block title link. Uh, this works for any kind of block, but inside of layout builder, it's just really convenient to be able to link the block title to something. Uh, and then these last two, these are sort of um, kind of approaches to low code with layout builder where you can customize the wrapper, uh, either of the component or the layout. Um, there's other techniques around that. So it, it's more if you've got like maybe a set of classes that someone's familiar with and they want to be able to drop one of those classes on a wrapper. <laughs> okay, how can you ask somebody what their favorite module is? I've given you a report that our developers have to give every Thursday. So that's all the modules. It'll get you a sheet that gets generated from the report. Let me know if you can get that. I am gonna highlight four that are in there. We like, probably from the bottom to the top, type tray. Again, my colleague had created that to help us organize how we're thinking about content and break things into content versus micro content pieces. Alongside that is rabbit hole. So I don't actually want an editor to link directly to say an automatic list or some little piece of content. I want them to go to the page that has that content. Also Drupal entity embed because we're taking those entity references, embedding them in variations now. So we started our first variation variants of embeds into basic pages. And then empty paragraph killer, just a nice one to have. Also, taking one step back before you're even implementing Layout Builder, let's just make sure that your budget can support it, that your timeline supports it, and that your client even needs it. Can they go with straight up basic pages? Maybe they can. Maybe they're asking for something that they don't actually need. Or you could just add a field called hero image onto the basic page. They could choose to turn it on or not. For us, we have a lot more variation, so we need to have a lot more flexibility. But before you commit to building the architecture, I know we love to build, but consider what suits your client's needs. And then again, as mentioned, translation. If, if you are doing translations of individual pieces inside, placed 
it may not be a great fit. Uh, if you're not doing translations, go ahead. That's great. And I, we will be posting the link to all these slides on the session description later. So if you're not getting your photos now or missing, don't worry, you'll, you'll be able to get to the slides later. Okay, so that's really focusing a lot about with modules available in the contrib ecosystem. Could you tell us about what kinds of features end up requiring custom code? Uh, so there's, there's different levels to this. Um, you, to create any uh, layout, you're gonna have to uh, create the layout plugin. Um, so you can use Drush to create a new layout in your theme. Um, corresponding with a layout, you need to pick a, uh, a class to, to power the thing. Um, there's the default class that really it's kind of a dummy thing, it just kind of makes it happen. But if you want to start adding options to your layouts, then you have to customize your, your layout plugin. Um, if you think about uh, the default ones that you get when you install Layout Builder, there's the multi-column ones. And so for those, you get a select option for um, the ratio of those column sizes. Uh, that, that's an example of what you could customize. So you could add more options to that form um, if you need to, for example, choose a color or have size options or have like left, right for image and text. Um, you may need to do something fairly complicated, like have some context of system state and like render the thing differently based on that. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you could do in a, a custom plugin class. Yeah, I would echo what Andrew said about creating your own layouts. Um, it provides, it's, you can sort of take a look at what exists in Drupal core. There's a module that Layout Builder depends on called Layout Discovery, and it defines some layouts. And then if you enable Layout Builder, Layout Builder disables everything that Layout Discovery adds and, and replaces it with its own. And on most of the projects I work on, I kind of remove all the layout builders layouts also and define all of my own because as Andrew said, you can define the settings, exact settings that you need for your particular use case. So, you know, background color behind of a section is a, is a, is a basic one, but um, you, can, you can go crazy with options. W one um, example uh, that we had recently, we had, a Solemn had a client who was interested in being able to place content on any page in an arbitrary place on the layout, and they wanted to be able to have it be a, a uh, an accordion, a part of an accordion. And so they wanted every block that's placed in there, in that section, to be part of the same accordion. So uh, we created a layout with a setting that is just a single checkbox that says, make this an accordion. And then every block that's placed in there, the title is the trigger, and the content of the block is the, is the panel that gets displayed. So we had that flexibility because we built our, we created our own layout with the setting that we needed to provide that accordion. I'll jump in too. For the custom code, we are asked by our client to not actually use anything except code that's contributed and covered by security policy. So we had quite a lot of restrictions on what we needed to do. And we ended up using customization for only things like the display or how the item is embedded into the page, like nothing more beyond that. This isn't code, but the um, one of the challenges uh, with the layout page is that the form elements and the text at the top of the layout page is styled using the default front end theme. And that may not always look great. So it, it, it helps if you may need to do a little bit of styling just to get that looking better. It just depends on what your default theme is. But I've just copied the styles from my admin theme and, and added them to my default theme. And then it's a bit, they're available. Uh, then, then the top part of the layout page looks like an admin form and not like my default theme. Uh, similarly with that, um, you have an option to enable content preview in Layout Builder. And um, sometimes when you're making your layout, you're thinking about what it looks like on the front end and you're testing things over there. But then you come back and you edit your layout and it's just not working right. Like you may have a hard time dragging a block into the right slot or something. So sometimes it does take a little extra effort to make the, the layout that you've created actually work in the editor.
All right. Tell us, what are the drawbacks of using Layout Builder? <laughs> so uh, again, this goes back to the beginning. What kind of budget do you have? Because 12 variations on one element is costly from the front end perspective. And looking back, we may have wanted to constrain it more than we did. So I'm just thinking to the math here. If we have five different ways that a promo can be displayed on a section and then three different backgrounds, and now we're talking about two different variations of that inside basic pages, it may be beyond the runway of what you can do front end wise or even back end wise in terms of setting those versions. So I think it really is uh, something that if you are committing to, you are going to want to have the follow on resources. There's no author is going to be happy with the first version. They're going to always want a variant of what you have just delivered. And then on top of that is <laughs> you have to do your accessibility checking. You have to make sure that you have everything in place with your images. You have to make sure that there's color contrast with accessibility you need to cover for all these different variations. So I think time-wise, costliness-wise, just getting your end client a reasonable estimate of the level of effort and then times point, you know, whatever to actually make it happen. Also, I think there's a bit of contention. I don't know if it's like this where you work, which is odd for me, but there's a lot of discussion, very heated discussion in the beginning of the project. And for us, that actually burned development time. So if you are gonna make a decision, give yourself a time box to make that decision because what ended up happening is we had all these theoretical, oh, what if we do this, what if we do that? And then the front end, a week before delivery is reporting in Scrum meetings that they're crying, right? So we don't wanna have that burden, I'm totally serious, <laughs> like, we, don't want, we do not want to have that burden of the implementation be at the very end of the project. You want it to be spread out across the whole development process, so it's a collaboration between your strategists who have ideas, your designers who have to design for those ideas, the front-enders who have to implement them, and yeah, the back-enders who are um, empowering it. So be respectful of your team and your client's needs. Come up with a solution and then just move forward with it, whichever one it is. It may not be Layout Builder, just, right. Uh, yeah, I, th I think um, it comes back to like uh, ach achieving the dream it takes some budget and t some time to get there. Because uh, as a content author, again, you might be imagining this beautiful system that's super easy to use. <laughs> And we can totally build that. It just takes a lot of effort to make sure that we're naming things well and that there's some indication of what that component's going to look like when you add it to your layout. My answer to the question is going to be a bit more technical than Nikki's and, um, and Andrew's. But um, Nikki alluded to it earlier, but um, searching content, indexing content for search when you're using Layout Builder um, has some additional challenges. Uh, just because, for example, that Drupal's built-in search just has no knowledge about that layout, uh, the layout, d the content in the uh, layout field. If you're using Search API, you can r you can index the rendered HTML, and that's one way to make sure you're getting all of that layout builder content. Uh, it's possible that there's that you that some blocks have been placed that you don't want as to be part of the index for the page. You're going to pollute your your search index with content, for instance, if you allow placing a menu um, in your in your layout builder uh, layout in the in layouts. So there's a module called Layout Builder Search API, and it allows you to target specific fields that are that are referenced within Layout Builder. So inline blocks. Let's say you have a uh, you know a basic block type with a body field you can just say to only index that body field when it's placed in Layout Builder, and it gives you extra options there. So that's another approach. Um, cloning entities uh, that have overridden layouts uh, can be challenging, and uh, there's no real great solution out there. There's an issue for the entity clone module, I believe, um, where, the, where that's being discussed, but the issue comes about because you're cloning the entity and these inline blocks have been placed and they're only supposed to be used once and now they're being referenced by two different entities. So the solution is to, of course, when you clone the, the entity, uh, the, the parent entity also clone the blocks and then reference them, but they're, 
there's some extra challenges with that. And then viewing differences between revisions, if you're using the diff module, for instance, and trying to compare revisions, there's, it's, um, there's some, some challenges with getting, um, getting that go looking good with Layout Builder. I know I had asked you when we talked about this before too about moderation. Does it work well with the moderation workflow and drafting content or not? In my experience, it does. <laughs> Thankfully. All right. Well, uh, wait. Can we? So, let's say you had a section of your layout that you needed to be published after embargo, right? So hold this information until uh, May 15th. So the editor is editing that content and then the publisher wants to place the content placeholder in the page in Layout Builder, but that specific section is not yet uh, released to the public. Can we still unpublish that, you know, or, or can we do a forward revision that then goes live of the layout page on that date and will it embed the correct version of that micro content? I guess those are questions. I, I don't know the answer. Are you asking, Rick? I, I, I'm trying to I remember, did we do this? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also dealing, you know, you're, you're talking about micro content and that is essentially nodes, but it's the same thing. It's still an entity, whereas content blocks, um, I mean, it should, th if you're using content blocks, it, it shouldn't make any difference, I don't think. But um, yeah. yeah, the data storage for layout builder is fairly straightforward. It just mm -hmm. takes all the things that you have in the layout and serializes it in a serialized array in, the, in a field. Um, so that can be revisionable fairly easily. Mm -hmm. All right, and then this is our last question before we're gonna open it up for you all to ask some questions. Um, but I asked each of our speakers to tell me what their favorite site is that they built with Layout Builder. And so we don't have time to go pull them up and do full demos, but they'll just talk to us about them a little bit and then you can go visit them. Oh yes, my baby for the last year and a half, iowa.gov and all variants of iowa.gov, including the Department of Corrections, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of et cetera. So take a look, iowa.gov. If you look at this and maybe two samples, workforce.iowa.gov and educate.iowa.gov, you'll see what we're attempting to accomplish, which is a very variety of authors all using the same tools to build their pages. So the site looks cohesive, but they have enough variation in between to put their own content, their own spin on the content and target it to their own constituents, but it still looks like it's all one entity. So this is my, the last site I worked on, um, it's Landmarks. It's a, uh, uh, it's a art studio at um, University of Texas, Austin. Um, so this is a component on the home page, and it's a responsive grid with some pretty complex uh, grid layouts, including the whole slanty thing in the top right, and that was tricky. Um, so when I approached this, I was thinking about what these things are a lot of them are blocks that are essentially referencing content. Um, so I was able to separate the layout from the content inside of it and think about um, just creating the template that had the grid positions that once that was in place, it was really straightforward to just drag the blocks into it. So a huge win for Layout Builder. And my site is uh, UCLA Health at uclahealth.org. Um, is they partnered with Solemn to build a uh, flexible web platform that, um, that supports a, a really wide range of content with, about, with more than 400 subsites and some 250 content editors who are working on the site at all times, working within Layout Builder mm -hmm. on their individual pieces of the site that they have uh, permission to edit. If you want to learn more about the project, come to the Healthcare Summit on Thursday. All right, so thank you for sharing all that wonderful knowledge. Um, now we have a, do have a few minutes left so we can take some questions. I, I think if you're in like the front of the room, maybe you wanna come forward and speak into the mic, otherwise I'm gonna have we to. Can, we can repeat the questions. Okay. 
Yeah. Yuri. I don't think I can, unfortunately. Is anyone in my developers here in the room? <laughs> uh, no, just at the time of our doing it, we weren't. Oh, and the question was that one of the other agencies showed a switch from paragraphs to layout builder or a switch from layout builder to paragraphs? Paragraphs to layout builder is better. Paragraphs to layout builder because they handle transitions better. Mm, I'll have to go talk to Matt about that. Question. We built a site using Layout Builder, and it needed to have three translation layers. And we used Layout Builder asymmetric translations module to do that, so that you could clone the node and then only change blocks. However, I was going to ask what the problem was, but be because of revision history of the blocks, we were running into issues where you would clone a node and change the cloned uh, block data, save it, and it wouldn't register. It would still be like an old revision record of that block. And so the client, the content editors were, would have to delete the block, replace it again, which makes cloning of the node moot in the first place. Uh, so I, th I think the way we handled it, the backenders did this, but I think they went back into the records and would only grab the latest one. So would wipe the revision history of the block when you cloned it. So I was wondering, if, if you knew the solution to it, I would love it, because it's better than wiping the whole revision history. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have an answer because I haven't worked on a translated site in a while, but I have seen a, um, a translation issue keep popping up in the queue, so I know it's being actively worked on, but I don't fully know the context around it. I'd say to go take a look, and because it, it changes day by day. I think I need to just talk with Rick about this. So uh, what we do is we take the node and we embed it. So if the node needs seven different translations and then the layout page is also its own translation, then you start to get weird interactions because it doesn't know which version of the node to place as micro content into the big landing page. I think that's where we had the like stretch. And also like what was pointed out, forward revisions are kind of tough and we do moderation plus forward revisions plus revisions and now you have authors who aren't sure what the state of their current content is, right? Yeah, we have two moderations. moderations. Yeah, and so now when you're having moderations on little pieces of content, micro content, and then moderations on the landing page where that content is gonna be placed, we have lots of variations happening at the same time. Question? Do you wanna come out to the front? Or? So how well does Layout Builder work with paragraphs, or would you do that? Yes, uh, there's a Layout Paragraphs module. So um, it's kind of similar to placing any field that you have uh, in your content type as a block in the layout. Um, it would just let you, um, you know, once you, def once you define it through the edit form, you'd have those available to place in but the layout. Layout Builder, Layout Paragraphs is is not using Layout Builder though, right? It's using l the Layout function in dr functionality in Drupal, but and then paragraphs, I think. But, oh, I, okay. but if, uh, I think par <laughs> paragraphs just being another, another entity type, um, I think it plays well. W we don't use paragraphs on uclahealth.org, so I can't say for sure. I, I saw a demo at the Pantheon booth and it it looked good, but it was using the Mercury Editor instead of Layout Builder, and I, I'm actually kind of wondering the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I know as, as part of the Experience Builder, part of, you know, they list they're going to be bringing in some of the best elements of paragraphs, and I'm super curious to see what that means and how that's going to work, because my background is mostly paragraphs-based stuff, so I don't know. Maybe there's some 
anyone who's been working on that initiative, there might be some specific ideas of how that's going to work, but I feel like right now there's kind of limited integrations between them. Do you have a question or you're going to add? So custom blocks that are placed via Layout Builder and inside the block there's paragraphs. So the question is for content editors that want to see good previews of the layouts pages they're building, if there's any good modules or solutions for that. I, I have seen a module that's related to live previews. Um, I didn't get a chance to test it yet, though. Um, I'm also seeing some issues re related to live previews as well. Instant preview. says it's not very popular but it works great yeah. in the back corner you can hear <laughs> yeah all right uh, uh, we have like one more minute does anybody else have a question Chris If I can repeat the question. <laughs> uh, basically, it is Layout Builder provide a way? So for content editors who have trouble visualizing what it is they're building on the page, does Layout Builder provide a way to give more visual preview understanding of? Right. Does it solve that problem to help visualize the page or just create more? Yeah. What do you all think? Uh, it's a little tricky. I think, I think um, like oh, the template concept to me is related to um, the managed display uh, when you're configuring the layout for a content type. Um, and that's kind of what you want to see an example of when you're creating a new one. So you, if you sort of know this content type has this layout and I can see that on other pages, if I go to create content of this type, that's set up to have this layout when I save it. Um, I think there's movement on this live preview aspect, and I think that's a huge part of this that we're all looking for. Um, I think within Layout Builder, there's, there's aspects of this with, um, one of the cool things about Layout Builder is the, the icon that gets generated for a layout that lets you browse the options in the sidebar. Um, and it's generated from like just a little map that you make in YAML, and it's super easy to customize. Um, some of the other customizations for Layout Builder, um, the, the Layout Builder browser, um, I think you need to have an image or a screenshot of that component so that... You, you can, it's optional. Um, but, but that's the kind of thing that would help the user um, know what's going in there. 
like part of your question is about um, the edit form versus the layout builder. Because in the edit form, you're, you're editing the title, the body, maybe you have paragraphs, and it's all just one big form. Um, but then you would save that, go over to Layout Builder, and then you have those fields available to place in the layout. But that may not be the paradigm you're talking about, because if you're talking about templated content, that later one was flexible content. So um, maybe if you customize the like node ad page and just kind of add a screenshot there of what the final thing looks like, that's the kind of stuff that would help editors make sense of things. Yeah, I would just add that given because the layout page uses your front end theme, you're going to get a better representation of what the content's going to look like than all right, I think we're going to have to stop there because we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, our panelists. And please. <laughs>